Welcome to Beyond the Press Release, a production of Agoracom, in which we take the time to interview small cap executives about recent developments in their companies. With us today, I'm happy to have, for the first time ever, Harry Barr from his organic farm in Hawaii. He's president, CEO, and director of NextGen. Trades on the Canadian Stock Exchange under the stock symbol N for our friends in the U.S., NXTTF, and for our friends in Germany, M5BN. Now, for those of you who are new to the NextGen story, uh, this is a company that is focused on investing in the medical marijuana, industrial hemp, and alternative medicine sectors. Their vision is to become the leading provider of venture capital, conferences, and education for the purposes of becoming the facilitator inside this explosive new industry. Now, more than just lip service. The man leading this charge is Harry Barr. He's got over 30 years of public and private company experience. During that time, he's completed over 300 option joint venture agreements, raised over $250 million to advance projects in nine different countries. This is a man that definitely knows what he's talking about, and we're glad to have him on. Harry, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us on, George. Great to have you on. Thanks for joining us from uh, from across so many time zones in the Pacific. Before I get into the big news that you announced today about your conferences division, first thing I want to talk to you about is uh, your your family's uh, long history in the hemp business and growing hemp and hemp farming because you're not just some Johnny come lately. We see a lot of companies putting out press releases just trying to ride the medical marijuana wave but have no real experience and no real intention. Tell me first about your pedigree in, in this space. Well, the Barr family, at least ours, came from Scotland, George, in uh, 1866. They got on a, I guess, a boat, came all the way across to Newfoundland, Newfoundland up to Montreal, and literally walked from Montreal to the Ottawa Valley. Uh, there we have a farm on a nine-mile road that is still to this day called the Barr Line. That farm, our Barr family, uh, has had since 1866. I would have been the fourth-generation farmer, and that's what my brother is. His kids are the fifth. My grandfather, Harry Barr, the same name, actually grew hemp for the war efforts uh, in the late 30s, early 40s, right on one of the farms that I grew up on. So my dad always told me about that was the field that, uh, in my case, Grandpa Harry grew the hemp, and it was used uh, for the war efforts to make rope because it's one of the strongest natural fibers in the world. Yeah, and, uh, and I love that pedigree. That's, that's so important. Today... Uh, your company announced the establishment of a conference division, and you intend to host Canada's first conferences, uh, focus on the business opportunities around uh, medical marijuana, industrial hemp, and so on. Um, why did you make this announcement? Because you're not running into the production side of things like a lot of people are. And how is this fitting into your overall strategy? Well, our overall strategy is not just to be a conference company. We want to buy into a basket of these type of projects, George. And basically, this to me was putting it all together in one room. It's the hub. It's the reason people who are in this industry who want capital would come to us and people who have capital would be able to provide it to them. Uh, the industry has, in my mind, been a little bit underground over the years and obviously with the new rules in Canada, April 1st, things have changed. The government have got real serious and the, the growers that are licensed, that are going to be licensed, there's some three to four hundred applications in progress, are people that are inspected from top to bottom from the RCMP to Health Canada and they spend a lot of money putting these facilities together. But there are a lot of people involved in what we call in the mining business the picks and shovel type people and we want to invest in a lot of those companies. In a way the conference is the first place you would come to buy your picks and shovels to go out and do what you have to do in the industry much like the old mining business. But we're putting a lot of people together in one room real experts at each end of what they do. In the case of medical marijuana, we'll have some of the top growers, some of the top horticulturists, we'll have some of the universities there, and people who know how to grow these different strains that actually do help people. In the case of industrial hemp, one of the fellows on our advisory board is one of the top growers in eastern Canada. And in 1998, the hemp business came back to Canada because they made it legal again. And it's an unbelievable plant that does a lot of different things. And so this uh, young gentleman, uh, his name is Reuben Stone, uh, will be at our conference and he'll be talking about both the challenges and, and the advantages and, and why he is a young 30-year-old farmer, again, about a fourth-generation Ottawa Valley boy. I got his name, George, because I asked my brother, the fourth-generation farmer, who's the top hemp guy 
he said, let me get into my Rolodex. He doesn't use a computer, but his office does. And he phoned me back in five minutes. I phoned the man and his wife and their little baby, and they came to Toronto about three, four days later. And after a night of you know just talking and where we're going, we decided we we're going to work together. So I'm quite and, happy to have. And this is what the industry really needs, right? Because we're you know it's at the really at the beginning here. It's it's yeah. it's a nascent point, and this well, conference, these conferences are going to serve as a, as just bringing everyone together and making connections happen. Well, I mean, I looked at him as an advisor, Mr. Stone. He's, again, 30 years old. He's about fourth generation. Very serious guy. His wife is very serious. They're both into this. They're doing it on their family blood. And what I mean by that, they're, this is their farm forever. If one of us lost a business or whatever, it's devastating. If somebody loses a farm, it's like losing that farm for all the generations of people you were there, right from the get-go. And so, these guys are putting all their money to try and build hemp in eastern Canada into something big. And they have different areas that need to be financed too. So you're you're intending to hold conferences in Canada, the United States, and Europe, but the first one is set for Vancouver on the May on May seventh. Now that's pretty fast. We're we're March twentieth right now. Uh, yeah. You've just come off a monster conference of the PDAC. There's not a lot of time to put this together. So is it safe to assume that you've got some good early feedback and response already and that you're not just starting from scratch here? Unbelievable. We're first to market and next week we'll be able to tell you who's helping us. We've got one of the best guys in the industry doing the conference thing. I'm not a conference expert, George, but I will tell you, and I said to the young fellows who helped me, I've gone to more conferences than he's ever dreamt of. I've been going to conferences since I was 23 years old okay, to promote basically mostly mining but other things too. I went to agricultural things. I went to oil and gas things. You know, I, the conference thing is really in my DNA. My youngest son, who's now working for me, 22, just got out of McGill. At four years old, he pulled my 10 by 10 booth down because he grabbed the wire, and he was standing with a little suit in that conference down in San Francisco. So what we kind understand. Of, what we kind understand of early enough. response are you? What kind of early response have you gotten from uh, your network and your connections, your people, Vancouver, to? You know, what, we what started we looking expect. at a one-day scenario. I'm sure we could easily take into four now. We're staying with the one-day scenario. We started with a room that would have 300, then we went to 600, 900. There could easily be a couple thousand, maybe 3,000 people there. The whole town wants to know about this new industry. Unbelievable, Harry. And uh, so I guess we're all, we're all going to look forward to announcements the coming weeks in terms of uh, speakers and, and uh, guests and companies and all those things. I, I think it's a fabulous uh, initiative. Now, you're taking a different approach. It seems like uh, most people that are trying to enter and take advantage of the new, uh, you mentioned earlier, the new regulations in the Canadian medical marijuana industry and so on, are, are really focused on production, cultivation, and distribution. You're not going there. You're taking a completely different approach. Why? Well, I mean, the biggest reason is it's, it's an industry, as much as I know about growing, that I think has to spend a few years to kind of come together. The challenges there I see, I mean, the upside is it's a, a great new industry and some companies are going to get to market first, just like we got to market first on this convention. Today we had five or six real groups come to me and say, we were just about there. We were first to market. So the guys that are going to be first to market in this industry of growing legal marijuana in Canada are going to do well. But they have to educate the doctors because not a lot of them know about it. They have to develop new strains that actually do things within the industry to help patients. They have to find those patients. Another thing we're going to do, I mean, just our conference alone is going to bring people in, ed educate some of these people, and they will know a lot more about the industry. So to me, the conference is a hub. Our idea is to be in about 10 different businesses within the industry before the end of the year. Do you think we're going to find those people at the conference? Already, just because of a business model, we have over 45 business models and plans we're reviewing right now. There are a lot of junior companies in Canada looking for deals, George. We already got it. With this conference, it's just going to put them all together, business to business. Now, um, you've had a long, successful career in the mining space, and you're going to continue that. It's not as if you're leaving the, the, the mining industry. Absolutely not. It's in my DNA, just like the bar line is for, since 1866, our family farm. But to be distracted, for, for the sake of a better term, to actually venture off here into medical marijuana, a, a, a guy with your experience and your success that we outlined at the beginning of this interview, you see something. What is that you see about the medical marijuana space? How is this different from, and I don't want to name any of them, but how is it different from some 
you know, quote unquote industries that have popped up over the last five, ten years, they turn to be flashes in the pan, and then they're gone uh, maybe a year later. What are you seeing about medical marijuana and well, where it's going to be five to ten years from now? Hemp in China has been growing for thousands of years. There are European countries that didn't ban it. This, the only reason, in my opinion, they banned it is because one of the strains, one of the plants, has THC and it was misused. Alcohol can be misused. They put a prohibition on this. You know behind the scenes there are billions and billions of dollars, probably trillions of dollars, you know, of this product sold illegally. It causes some of the craziest things in the world. Just the other day I was reading about an article of a young man who had killed thousands of people on the Mexican border. He was replaced. They got him finally, and they got him years ago. He hid away. Long story short, they got him again. Within a day or two, another multi-billionaire replaced him. Without, If marijuana and, and uh, hemp were legal, that wouldn't be happening. I'm not going to say they're not going to replace it with something else. But because the plant is so cheap to grow, almost anybody could, you can make a lot of money illegally off it. Now imagine that was gone. There are thousands and thousands of people in Canada and a lot more in the U.S. in jail. Some of them because they had, you know, one marijuana cigarette. I'm not an advocate of it. I've got four kids. I don't want them smoking it. I don't smoke it. I have tried it. <laughs> I said the old Bill Clinton story was, you know, he did not inhale it. I did inhale, okay? I will tell everybody. And the bottom line, if I was single and I met Monica, I probably would have dated, you know. But the bottom, the next bottom line is I don't, I'm not a, I don't believe that somebody should be just wasting their life by smoking this stuff all day. But I do believe that if you're dying of cancer and there's just one shred of decency you can give these people, and that product is that one, then they should have a chance at it. Five, ten years from now, where do you see the industry? How... How big does this get? You've, well, you've got Health Canada talk about two point four billion dollars, uh, but you've got other you've got other people saying, "Hey, once this well, really starts to accelerate, like, gets accepted, it, it yeah. several like times bigger." Like hydroponics alone in North America right now, without even this, is a billion, multi-billion billion dollar industry. Every one of these industries I'm talking about is is already there. So what happened, for example, in Colorado, and, and I. I get down here a fair bit, and a lot of people say, well, you're on the beach, Harry. Well, the truth is, if you ask my wife, I started at 1.30 a.m. this morning. I, I was still working you know, today and yesterday around 11 last night. It's because I'm very excited about what I'm doing. And the bottom line is, when I started to watch in November that the CNNs of the world and the big channels were carrying a story about Sanjay Gupta, who is a guy I have a lot of time for. He's their top doctor. And he said, look, I didn't ever delve into this. And he delves into almost everything. If you watch CNN, I've watched it for 20 years. And what he was delving into this time was, let's see if this product actually is what people say it is, or it, should it be a banned substance. And if you get a chance to look at uh, the uh, people in the audience, it is a series. It's a four-part series. Almost every night to this day, as we know since November, CNN is running a part of it. And what I it helped turn me a little bit too. We were already been researching. We've been we've been looking hard at this industry since mid last summer. I mean, when I go, George, I go hard, right? And when we first started, we looked at uh, the grow up business, okay? And we looked and we dug into the laws, and then we negotiated with people in there, and then we negotiated with a smart fellow who had a uh, a clinic and wanted to build out some clinics, especially clinics. And then we looked at the guys that were building everything from hydroponics to whatever. And what we decided to, because our expertise is really venture capital, is to really build a company that can go into any one of those industries. So I'm not, to finish the story on the grow ops, there's, there's a lot of applications. In my mind, there's a little too many. There's up, somewhere up to 400. Okay? There's, anyway, and you get a different story every day, but I heard a pretty official source. There was about 9 or 10 legal. And a good one is Tweed, if any of your people follow it. It's uh, in a town, my Ottawa Valley farm is here, and the other beautiful place I like in this world is Thousand Islands. This town, Smith Falls, is halfway in the middle, so I know this plant. In fact, the plant, one of my uncles, Earl Barb, on the same bar line I had, was a millwright who built it. It was the old Hershey's plant. And Tweed has a very good company that raised $10 million, and they put together one of the first key plants. Uh, I think it was February 8th, they got their license to sell. You know, they're going to, they're reversing into a public company right now, and they will be one of the bigger growers public. Uh, I learned a lot by following them because it's a big operation. You know, 
they could easily have spent 10 million. I met with someone not long ago who was a key broker in the deal. They, they would like to raise a lot more. So these are multi-million dollar spends, and you've got to get them right. If any company's going to get it right from my research, that'll be one of them. But how many of these do you need? Where are they going to find the, the clients? You know, how long are they going to get up to speed to do it? Will the some forty thousand uh, licensed people now grow to four hundred thousand like everyone's talking about fast? I think they will, but I think doctors, uh, in general, were not trained in university in the benefits of these products. They now need to be trained. And my line is. When I was a young fellow, I had a job, I turned it down with Xerox, and they used to call those young guys Xeroids. They all had the right suits on, and they said the right story, and they got trained for a long time before they went on the road. I think these companies have to do that. They've got to have a sales force trained, and they've got to go into these doctors' offices, and they've got to say, here's why you need to buy my product over theirs. And if you can imagine, if a lot of these, if there's two or three hundred of them built, you know, it might be too much too fast. Now, I don't know that for a fact. That's the research we're doing. So we want to work with companies like that. We want to have them come and get on a panel and debate that kind of question. Why are you going to be better? You know, why are you going to be better than the next guy? Why wouldn't you buy that hydroponic light that you didn't know about in that booth over there? What about this guy's, uh, you know, fertilizer from uh, California where they've been growing it down there for 20 years over one from over here? You know, it's it's a, it's so exciting. It's brand new that nobody really knows. But Aaron, Canadians and Canadian entrepreneurs know how to raise money, raise capital, run public companies, and get things done. So that's the kind of guys I want to hang with, and I want to put my arms around a guy like Reuben Stone from the Ottawa Valley, a three-year-old farmer who is you know one of the top guys in his industry in industrial hemp, and see where do you want to go? Where can I fit in to finance you? How can I get? something for our shareholders from you and still build a hemp business. He goes around his world, which is Eastern Canada and Eastern U.S., and speaks about why this should happen, why he's one of the, the biggest of what he does, and how he can be much bigger, and more importantly, what it could do for the world if he was able to expand and get other farmers into it. Well, Harry, it's hard to argue with the, uh, with the, with the merits of the business model. And it's even hard to argue, argue with someone like you who's been in the business 30 years. Uh, you've raised over $250 million for projects in nine different countries. Um, it's March 20th. Your first conference is on May 7th. I get the feeling we're going to be back on here again between now and then, uh, talk about more and more updates. Uh, it sounds like you're on to something great, and next-gen shareholders are, uh, are pretty lucky to have you. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for having us. You've been watching Harry Barr. He's President, CEO, and Director of NextGen. Uh, trades on the stock symbol N in Canada, NXTTF in the U.S., and M5BN uh, in Germany. You can find them on Agoracom, punch in the stock symbol, get great information like this, but for other information from other shareholders in the great community. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a fantastic day, and we'll see you next time.